This is Ray Stokes in the oral history section of the TCOM library here in Fort Worth on, let's see, what is today? I believe it's the 20th of October, 1989. And I am just completely thrilled to have the experience that we're about to enjoy and talking with a very dear friend of mine that I've known since about 1969, who's a general practitioner over in Mesquite, Texas, been very closely identified with the growth of the school these many years, and it's a pleasure to welcome and to recognize my good friend, Dr. T. Robert Sharp. And we're delighted to have you with us today, Dr. Sharp. We're remiss, we should have had you 10 years ago, because you, uh, we, we've been conducting this program now for over 10 years, so we certainly uh, should have included you among the first, but my apologies. No. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, We've broken the ice now, and we've told who you are, and, and I've identified myself, and we're glad to have you back on the campus. You've never been, you've never been a professor per se. I think you're, you're included, but what I mean is you don't come over here for a class every day and so forth. You're on the clinical uh, faculty. Uh, but uh, let's start at the beginning. Where'd you grow up? Where, where did you discover America? Well, as my neighbors and all would have said I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> Minnesota, huh? In uh, uh, 1920. All right. What, in 1920? Well, that means that you're getting close to three score and ten now. Oh, yes. Sure I'm does. looking forward to that. <laughs> oh, are you? Well, fine. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about uh, what you might be doing in the future, but uh, let's start at the beginning. Now, uh, uh, What's your uh, uh, educational background? Of course, I know you went to, Can uh, to uh, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, right. graduated in 44. True. But go back beyond there a little. Okay. Um, in those days, I lived in Illinois, mm -hmm. very northern part of Illinois, right. in Freeport, Illinois. And uh, there were four of we children, three of whom of us attended the uh, University of Dubuque mm -hmm. at Dubuque, Iowa. Uh -huh. Uh, probably because they had such a splendid uh, a cappella choir historical uh, existence. And my sister was quite a, a renowned singer, and mm -hmm. by her influence I was able to get accepted for a, uh, a uh, singing scholarship, and my brother as well. Mm -hmm. And so we attended there. My younger sister was too young to enjoy that relationship, but... Um, anyway, the three of us then did attend there. And, uh, and in those days, uh, pre-osteopathic, and I uh, required only two years of pre-med, mm -hmm. pre mm -hmm. uh, there were specified subjects that you had to have, and I had those. And so then, uh, but very pridefully, you see, my uh, uncle was a, a very dear friend, he was an M.D., I see. and of course he thought very much that I should become an M.D., and I asked him where he thought. He was a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, and I thought, well, maybe he would be able to give me some advice, and he suggested that the University of Iowa was coming on very strong, and not only that, they had a strength in the pediatric values, mm -hmm. and he thought that maybe that would be the the coming event. So uh, I did not opt for being an osteopathic physician at the time. I was too pride, proudful for that. I was going to be the real kind of doctor. Oh, you were. Oh, oh yes. Mm -hmm. But my brother, uh, <laughs> through it all, uh, through, I think, uh, oh, gosh, I've forgotten the doctor that was there nearby that took care of my family, mm -hmm. uh, was a DO. Oh, he was. And uh, he uh, presented my brother with the lengthening shadow of Andrew Taylor Steele mm -hmm. and uh, uh, impressed my brother enough that he, from the word he uh, time he read the book until the time he had matriculated, he was going to go to an osteopathic college. Now, was he older or younger? He was younger. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of turnabout, and I usually... I usually led the way, and here I was kind of following. Anyway, we, we started off. It was just about the time that things got a little bit cozy in the uh, European theater. And I recall that we had just gone downtown and bought a new car, 
But we started out of town and the thing gave up the ghost, so we went downtown and bought a new car. And we were going to make a tour to visit then the University of Iowa. And as well, because my brother was along, we were going to go down and visit Kirksville. Uh -huh. We started out then and went to the University of, of uh, Iowa, met with the whoever it was, I'll say the dean, I think you could even get to talk with the dean in those days. In those days, I see. And he reviewed my credentials and said, fine, you qualify. My dad says, now, you know, we have another son that's going to be going to college, and we have an older daughter that is in college, and we have a younger daughter that's coming up in college. So we need to be aware that this young man's going to have to have some means to be able to help to support himself. Well, that was the last thing to say. Mm -hmm. If you coming here to be able to come and work, don't you know that this workload is so heavy you will never have time? He would have, never have any time, and so forth and so forth. So it was a kind of a dimish type of, it kind of put a damper on my enthusiasm, though I liked the school. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we motored on down then to Kirksville, which was maybe another 200 miles. Yeah. And gracious sakes, when we got down there, there was not one of the people that we met that had horns. None of them had crippled backs. They didn't. They had eyesight, and they even spoke English. <laughs> and I thought, well, now, isn't this remarkable? <laughs> and they were interested, and they were quite helpful, and they said, absolutely, we can help you to secure employment, mm -hmm. if no more than your board and room or something on that order. But yes, those things are available, and we certainly would work with you. Yeah. And just coincidentally, the maybe two days ago, I came across some old papers, and it was the, the uh, itemization of the cost of going to school. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my brother's, it was not mine, so I sent it to him right. this past week. Anyway, the, it was $225 a semester. I, I'm quite sure now, mm -hmm. he matriculated in 1942, mm -hmm. in the spring of 42. Yeah and I matriculated at Kirksville then. Anyway, I turned my entire thinking around and we went out and saw the school and the way it laid out, went to the old hospital there, but it was great to me because I could walk inside right, as right. an observer, not mm -hmm. a patient. Yeah. And it, it was quite impressive. I did also have a cousin that was there in, and matriculated there. Mm -hmm. And he was a senior as I came into school who is still in practice in Michigan. Anyway, that was kind of the background of how I ever got through to Kirksville. Well, tell me, I know something else uh, that you did have a little bit of time because you, you I believe you met your first wife, Marjorie, uh, at Kirksville. I did. Uh, she give was us a, a little story about, uh, well, she was also a student. We, we yeah. matriculated at the same time. The same she time. being from Texas, and I thought, now, isn't that funny? Anybody had come all the way from Texas. See, I'd probably been out of the state once in my life. Mm -hmm. That was in Michi uh, Minnesota, where I was born. <laughs> and so I thought, my gracious sakes, anybody that'd be in Texas has got to be an awful what, long way. Uh, what part of the state was she from? She was from uh, Ellis County. Ellis County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she, she was born in common with my wife. She, my wife was born in Ellis County. County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was born in what they call P A L M E R Palmer, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you can use the pronunciation, right. I presume. Right. <laughs> anyway, then uh, uh, she, at that time, however, was living in a little larger city mm -hmm. called Ferris. Yeah. And coincidentally, she had um, a, uh, uh, her mother worked for a Dr. George Lubel, who I'm sure you're sure, yeah. quite familiar with. Yes, sir. If it wasn't for him, none of this would be, isn't that right? Correct. Anyway, he was quite a wise person, and I recall that uh, uh, she was quite satisfied. And Dr. Morell Sparks and Sam Sparks were a part of that same scene. In fact, my wife was going to be just like Dr. Morell. She was going to be the greatest female doctor that ever was. So we matriculated at the same time and married. When I was a senior, she, well, early we discussed it, and I said, well, there's going to be one doctor in our family, my family. Mm -hmm. And so I opted to be the doctor. You opted to be the doctor, huh? <laughs> she did so, go back to the University of uh, North Texas mm -hmm. and got her degree in uh, foods and nutrition and was a registered dietitian. So we had some kind of right, you interplay did. there, you see. Well, mm -hmm. 
Well, then, all right. Now, then, you got out of school. And after you got out of school in 44, uh -huh. you uh, were going to heal the world, I understand. Oh, sure. well, where did you start out healing? Well, I went to an internship with Dr. Kugler, Paul Kugler, in the southern part of the, uh, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. because my folks and we had lived so well from graduation times in northern Illinois, and so within maybe about 150 miles of my folks' home was this osteopath that had a hospital, and he had two interns on a regular basis. <laughs> and so I left to go up there. It was a small town. And about that time, you see, when I matriculated in the fall of 41, within just a few months, uh, there was a Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And then we continued as a class I think we had roughly a hundred plus in attendance when we began, and by the time we graduated, we had somewhere around 33, mm -hmm. because they were drafted from all different parts of the country to right. go into the armed services. Right. Mm -hmm. At the time, we were not given commissions in the armed services oh, that's right. uh, as physicians, and so therefore we, they, uh, the boards by and large, were quite generous about allowing us to complete our training. And so at the end of my internship, uh, we had had VE Day, and of course VJ Day was in the fall. Mm -hmm. We went uh, six days a week, Monday through Saturday morning, and then we had Saturday afternoon and Sunday off. We had Christmas and New Year's and the 4th of July, I think it was vacation days. And, uh, in other words, we went through the summer and through the uh, winter without break. It was a long, kind of a difficult time of the I profession, I presume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was for the entire nation, but I did not have to go to the armed forces. How, how many years did you practice in Wisconsin? Sixteen. Sixteen. Sixteen years. And uh, you got a, uh, I don't, I, I use this word advisedly when I say political in a sense, but uh, there are politics in any organization. Oh, yes. And you've been involved in the political aspect of osteopathy and the growth of the, the profession. Uh, when did you get involved uh, in something beyond treating patients? I would think about 1950. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was a young group called the American College of General Practitioners in Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery who had its base in the Los Angeles area, mm -hmm. and there were uh, uh, rumors that, that this thing would spread, and so it did. And we made application from the Wisconsin group, and most of us were general practitioners, though I think there were perhaps only a hundred doctors there, phys uh, DOs. Um, we generated enough enthusiasm to organize the first uh, uh, affiliate group from Wisconsin with the National Organization, the Wisconsin Society of the American College of General Practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you served as president of that association? Yes, we helped to organize it, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be the originating president. Okay. And it's still existent. Well, now you're also, of course, very active in the American College of General Practice. Oh, yes. Uh, and you've been the national commander of that uh, organization. Mm -hmm. What years? Uh, are we talking about? Well, I served on the board for a few years in the 68, 69, 70 variety, and then in 71 became its president, served till 72. Before we, let me uh, interrupt those, say, before hmm. we get too involved uh -huh. in your activities there, let's get you to Texas. Oh, how did, okay. how did, you, how did you get to the great Lone Star well, State? Well, you see, course, I, I realize your wife was a native Texan. There you go. So, <laughs> that was virtually the, the reason. It was the reason. I, see. Um, I was a small town practitioner. I was in a town of, there were two companion towns, and their total population was roughly a thousand. I was the only doctor there, and the only doctor in a community, well, within 19 miles, any one direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you born them and buried them, as we used to say. And that's the truth. I pulled mm -hmm. teeth and I set dogs' feet, I mean legs, <laughs> and, and such like. Uh -huh. There was no, uh, there was a dentist for a very short period of time, mm -hmm. and uh, there was not even a veterinarian, but this was, of course, right after the war. Right. And so 
uh, you did what you had to do. Uh, you, uh, what part of Wisconsin? The very southmost part, Close it was just outside of Madison, oh, right Madison. outside of Madison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. with that and uh, the scarcity of intercommunication, we did not have great rapport with most of the MDs about. Uh, you felt, uh, as you developed in practice, there were holes of information that you didn't feel competent in. And so uh, I suppose you, you became more and more interested in, in further and further education and information. And that was one of the reasons why the interest in the American College of General Practice, they required 50 hours of postgraduate work every year. Mm -hmm. The net result was that few of us did that, but some of us did, and it was that that kind of created a yearning for more interplay between our fellow man, as it were, our fellow osteopathic physicians, and uh, one of the reasons that compelled us to leave this small town, knowing that there were so many things that we couldn't do well because we didn't have number one time nor the experience to do it well. And so we came down here to be near my wife's folks and their family and her family. And uh, my folks about that time had moved from their location in northern Illinois down to Florida. So there was really no, no reason to stay there, you see. Where did you set up your first practice uh, in Texas? Uh, where I am today. I've been here now been there almost 30 years. Almost. <laughs> no, 29, a little over. A little over 29 uh, years, yeah. over in Mesquite, Texas. In Mesquite, Texas, correct, yeah. What's that address again? 4224. You've, been in, the, you've been in the same place? Yes. I, I, I interrupted you, and you didn't get the whole street. Uh, you, got the, you got the number, but you didn't get the name of the street. Oh, Gus Thomason. Gus Thomason. That's an yes, odd spelling of Thomason, yes. too, I believe. Thomas Son. Son. Uh, <laughs> so uh, apparently there was a Thomason in that area. Uh, I, I don't know who he yeah. is, but I assume that that's how they Well, now, you have an associate that I know very well, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Uh, he occupies part of the building, I think, that you have. He does. Uh, and didn't he also come from Wisconsin? Yes. He, uh, we first became acquainted when I was a senior, and he was then a freshman. He mm -hmm. was an entering freshman. He was married and to Bess Ann, and with whom he still enjoys his, his uh, wedded bliss. Good. And uh, I recall when the first youngster was born, he was uh, born shortly before he matriculated as a freshman. And so we met then in Kirksville, and uh, w we kept kind of close tabs, and he was a good general practitioner as well. Mm -hmm. So we uh, corresponded through all these years, uh, my years in Wisconsin, of course, and then subsequently uh, down here, and he was looking for a place. And uh, so he removed from uh, a suburb of Milwaukee to this area, and, and we talked about getting together and building a building and enlarging. And I had a building, but we did enlarge it when he did come, and it, uh, we expanded the size considerably. And so we have virtually separate practices, but we we share certain offices like the x-ray machine and this sort of thing. You know the first time I met you, do you recall? I don't suppose I do. Well, I'm not absolutely positive, but I believe it was at a District 5 meeting. Your state divided into yeah. districts, the Toma Osteopathic Medical Association, yeah. that you are part of, of course. Uh, but you had a meeting, uh, I believe it was in the, uh, the summer of 69, uh -huh. uh, uh, because Dr. Hart, who was our first dean, uh -huh. he and I would try to go around to various district meetings yes. and meet the yes. profession, uh -huh. uh, professionals. Uh, and we had a meeting, and I believe uh, uh, it was rather a memorable meeting. It, uh, we were very discouraged when we left there, we being Dr. Hart and myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I expect you were at that particular yes, meeting. Yes, I certainly was. Uh, there uh, were a number of people there that didn't think we'd ever make it. Yeah. Well, I believe that the, the commitment was, or the, the, the reason that you were there, was to see if there could be 
a groundswell of enthusiasm right. and uh, maybe honored by the fact of laying down a few dollars. That had something to do with and, it. And uh, I think the laying down of the dollars lost some of the enthusiasm, <laughs> but there are a few of us that stuck in there. Right. Well, you're, just lead, you're leading me right into the next question because it, it, it's certainly a known fact that you've been one of our, one of our greatest contributors, not only dollar-wise, but uh, also in time and, and interest. Uh, that you have certainly made a strong contribution to the school. Now, uh, you, of course, I have you listed among some of our sustainers, TCOM mm -hmm. sustainers. We had quite a group of those. Uh, right. We have a plaque, you know, on the eighth floor, the Med Ed 1, showing all of the persons, not necessarily DOs. We did have some laity who were con uh, good, strong donors. Uh, in fact, I think our strongest donor was uh, or still is she's still living is is a woman who who lives up at Amarillo. I'm getting I, off. I I'm getting a little that. bit off here, but we're talking about donors. You know, people yes. give to people; they don't give to things. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this particular person who knows nothing about TCOM other than what she heard from Dr. Earl Mann, her doctor. Yes, I know him, or knew him. Yeah, right. Oh. And uh, and she's been a very excellent donor to the yes. school down yes, through the years, is. and so has the Sharp family. Oh, which yes. we're certainly yeah. indebted. Now, you've uh, gained a little recognition here locally. What are some of the honors that you have been given uh, in this particular uh, section of the profession? Well, uh, shortly after I got here, I had the privilege of joining with uh, and becoming closer friends to Sam and Morrell Sparks and mm -hmm. subsequently became the chief of staff for a few years. Coincident with that, my interest with the general practice group continued, and uh, I uh, became a president of the uh, Texas State Society uh, of the American College of General Practice. And uh, as one does, you kind of hang in there, and there were some good old names, and there are still some good old names that were and still are mm -hmm. a member of that body. Um, there was a void after there was a Dr. Walton who subsequently became a member of the TCOM faculty, uh, was a quite a uh, good sustainer himself and, and went out and did a whole lot of homework and getting addresses and people to join the organization and all that kind of thing and did a heroic work. But he was about to leave that mm -hmm. and so I stepped back in as uh, the secretary treasurer and then I guess maybe because nobody else would <laughs> I continue right. but I'm not wanting to give it away I want somebody to push me away push. and say I can do it better and that's the type of person we want for well this. you know when we had our first graduation in 74 did uh, we had one of our uh, uh, honors uh, given away was the uh, Marjorie Sharp uh, Memorial. Uh, what what's the complete name? Well, it's it a, was it's, a, it's an honor that's given to yes. a student. Marjorie Sharp Memorial Room, as it were. It was a. Well, I know, but you also give a you give an annual. Oh, that's the undergraduate uh, general practitioner. Maybe I'm getting things mixed up a little bit yeah. here, but let's 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 take that. What was the first? Uh, uh, In the beginning, it seemed as though the students could be quite. Well, I'll say critical of their fellow man, mm -hmm. <laughs> of their peers. Mm -hmm. And so we entreated that the, that the students would be a part of the selection of the general practitioner of the year. A person who of their class, who of their senior class, not necessarily their senior class, junior or senior class perhaps, that would show the most promise of becoming an excellent general practitioner. Mm -hmm. And in an effort to tie, try to prime the pump, of contributions to the schools, Marge and I uh, decided that if we were to present something <coughs> in their memory uh, and put their name on it, perhaps sometime they would do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And so at times we bought different equipment pieces for different of the clinics that were just opening at the time. Right. And at uh, a time or two we even blessed them with a with an honorary, uh, oh, either a bond or sometimes a watch or something in that order. Yeah. Uh, 
so that that has kind of kept up and now maybe I'm a little disappointed because I don't know that I feel that the reason for it giving was certainly not to not to um, be any honor to us but to that student and to act as a primer mm -hmm. to be able to cause others to think by golly let's give something back to the school and especially the students mm -hmm. and I'm not sure maybe I've not done it well I've not done any research I wonder how those persons chosen as undergraduate general practitioner of the year mm -hmm. have fared as their responsibility or their giving back to the college I would like to determine that sometime and see if it was phenomenal in the back of my mind I would like to have a particular time when we might could invite them all back mm -hmm. and um, to have kind of a camaraderie with those persons that why that don't we be. why don't we work on that you know we're going to have the of course, I'm going to be an outsider at the time. You know, we're going to You'll have never the, be an outsider. <laughs> we're, we're going to have the 20th anniversary oh, yeah. during the convocation in 1990, the latter oh, yeah. part of September. Okay. And uh, Dr. Richards is working on plans okay. now. He's calling in all uh -huh. of the the original people that had anything to uh -huh. do with the school, sure. uh, both staff, faculty, and and, and students. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a two or three day celebration during uh, in conjunction with convocation, and also at the same time they have the it'd be the class of uh, It'd be the class of uh, of uh, eighty who will be uh, the class that will be honored in that particular sure. re reunion year. So uh, why can't we work out something on that where we can get those I people back? I think that'd be that excellent. Purpose? Yes, wouldn't that be great? It really will. Uh, let's let's we'll work on that. Mm -hmm. We really will. Yeah. Okay, let's go along now. Uh, you've been the president of the ACGP. You're also secretary treasurer that now, aren't you? Oh, yes. You're yeah, starting no. over again, are you, Dr. No. <laughs> I think after about 20 years, though, I'm looking for that man or woman that's going to take it from me. Right, and I hope right. they come quick. <laughs> well, now, you're interested in, in sort of the archival aspect of, yes. of that organization. Yes. And we had an off-camera conversation recently about uh, your search that you were looking. Have you been able to come to any conclusion? I contacted the Home Office, mm -hmm. and they, in turn, were gratified to have the name of the man that you gave us. Mm -hmm. We did call, and we were given the name of a young lady that lived in the Chicago area. I see. And it was my understanding that, that uh, our now mm -hmm. Uh, George Nyhart, who is our executive director of the American College of General Practice Home Office, was going to contact them and then, having contacted them, find out what the cost might be and then help us get started in doing the same archival work that you have done mm -hmm. uh, on a national level. It's, you know, there's a history, and I suppose when you finally get old enough and around long enough to become the historian, that means that they still say, hi, I know your name, and that's about the last of it. Now, I don't mean to take anything from you, because you've made a, quite, a, quite oh, no. a scene of it, and oh, that's good. No, no. But, we, that, but in yeah. most organizations, that doesn't happen. Right. And I have been chairman of that for a number of years, and finally I got a little bit provoked. <laughs> and uh, we were given $1,000, and I said, well, golly, we couldn't even call a meeting, uh, a meeting of the group of them together, of the, of the committee people, <coughs> that if we didn't have enough money to work with, why wait? I mean, mm -hmm. why start? Mm -hmm. Well, they gave us 2500 and then after we got a little bit more steam going, they gave us another 2500 so we have 5000 to start. But our prediction was that we would need about $25,000 on a national level to be able to do a reasonable job of being able to do the work that you have so well done. And uh, you might recall that uh, I called you and asked for your information about and was informed that it is not a historian because they're different, but an archival person who right. are digging out those things that were and putting them in, in proper order. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, now then, let's go back a little bit and discuss some of our initial activities that we had together. We, you and I used to attend a number of meetings uh, and various district meetings and so forth. Uh, and I guess you were out at the 1970 convention in Lubbock. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a meeting sure. that, uh, well, really the college really, really got off the ground it because was, we did yes. have a great deal of, uh, uh, of uh, 
fundraising efforts and achievement because we did, I don't know how much, but quite a bit we gathered there at that time. Mm -hmm. And of course that was uh, a meeting that uh, uh, where it was kind of difficult to, to know exactly where we stood, but we were making progress. Right. And I remember one particular doctor there who's no longer with us, uh, who died a few years ago, who was very active in the political part of this uh, of politics in the state, had made the remark that uh, unless we could get $26 million together at one time, we should not open the school. Well, of course, that being the case, we never would have opened. There's True. no question about that. True. And no disrespect to that man in his thinking. He was, <coughs> he was entitled to that. He certainly was. Uh, but then uh, you and I had something else in common back in the early 70s. We didn't have much money to help dole out or to help the students who were in dire need of some financial assistance. But you served with me on the committee that I had the honor of chairing for a while uh, in the, uh, the loan and scholarship committee of the TCOM. And then you succeeded me, I think, along about 73 mm -hmm. or 74, and you stayed in that capacity for how long? Give us a little bit of a rundown on what the committee was able to do during those <coughs> former four <coughs> years. Pardon me. <coughs> well, <coughs> having gotten off to a good start, we had probably about four or five committee men at mm -hmm. that time. Right. right. Committee persons. Right. <coughs> then subsequently, uh, I think we added a few more heads mm -hmm. and <clears throat> enlarged uh, the scope to concern itself with both scholarship and, and um, uh, loan. And <clears throat> there were a number of us that um, felt that in our time we paid for our own and we were a little bit adverse to <laughs> Some of this, uh, yes, I'm going to come to school and I don't have penny one, but that isn't the way that you were supposed to conduct that thing. And so it became increasingly evident that, that you had to disregard the particular need, and my disenchantment began, I'll put it. Mm -hmm. And so I left it in good hands yeah. before I might could poison anything there. <laughs> oh, uh, I wouldn't say that. But anyway, uh, they are still certainly active. And I think they have some fine people. There was a number of names, but I'd, I'd hate to name them because it might embarrass them. But uh, we had some good thought, some good, strong uh, intercommunication, and we would meet on a regular basis and determine whether there were persons that were eligible, and if they were eligible, how much, and how much did we have in resources, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Certain of them were able to encourage others to donate to the school in the way of a scholarship and such like so that we might. Well, they also about that time they started establishing certain rules on a national level yeah. as, that, uh, in other words, in order to grant, to get loans, they had to come from a family that didn't have too much uh, Yes, you income. couldn't buy a, uh, you couldn't buy a student's uh, underwriting as right. it were. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. very true. And uh, that really, uh, could have become a problem perhaps, but I don't believe ever did. I, see. I really think it did not ever become a problem. Yeah. Uh, the people that, uh, that wished to donate, they said, well, fine. Uh, maybe then they could earn it on their own right, and right. sometimes they did. Right. Uh, but we were able to go from a few funds, maybe, what, maybe $10,000 to, I think, maybe it's in, I don't think it's a hundred thousand, but it could be approaching that by now. Right. So we have something to work with now, and it is, it was our thought, most of us in the earlier years, and mm -hmm. I think yourself included, that they should have it not so much as a grant, though we were able to get grant money and give this, mm -hmm. but that if we could prime the pump, they could pay it back. And we, we set mm -hmm. the interest rates at such infinitely low levels that we thought it would encourage them to pay back early before they got into paying too many percentage of, in, of interest. Mm -hmm. But we were outguessed. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we had persons to apply and get grants uh, because they could more cheaply buy or borrow money from us than they could from, so that always it takes a few spoilers to, to mm -hmm. interfere with what the plans are. And so the laws or the rules were again modified and I think to a betterment. Yeah. 
Uh, it's been, uh, I want to get back to uh, the late Marjorie Sharp. Oh, yes. Uh, she and I, we made a few trips together, if you remember, and, and, and fundraising efforts and so forth. And, uh, and she was a great assist, assist, or great help, I'll put it that way, in some of the efforts that I tried to uh, employ. And I know one particular trip that we made over, we were mentioning the, uh, the Sparks. Mm -hmm. they were, yes. Didn't they open the first hospital in Texas? Yes, they did, and the trained the first Merrill Sparks. interns. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that where George Lubel interned? I would think it was. I think it was. I believe it. Uh, it is highly likely and maybe one of the very first. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I think he could tell you better about that. Right. But I do know that they, I think, continued for as long as they were active in the hospital business, except for the exodus that they took down to Central Texas to retire, which they didn't do, mm -hmm. um, they had continuous interns for those 20-odd years uh, that I know about. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, in fact, they were the first two train residents and, uh, in fact, the first osteopathic hospital in the state. Yeah. Uh, in 1980, mm -hmm. we had our 10-year celebration. Right. The school had yeah. been open for 10 years, and you were involved in the in the celebration we had at that time. Of course, we had already lost Marjorie. When did we lose her? In 78. 78. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about your experience on that occasion, the uh, dedication of the Marjorie Memo uh, sure. Sharp Memorial Room. Well, about the time that we historically became certified as general practitioners, there was quite a coincidence as far as TCUM is concerned. We had a, we had an, an application for certification for general practitioners, which fell on very deaf ears in the national AOA. I see. But we persisted and ultimately developed a program in residencies which required that there should be certified persons. And so in a, an effort about that same time, there was a, an effort that was successful in presenting a residency in general practice, and it was approved by the American Osteopathic Association, which incorporated that they shall have certified people training them, and therefore we born both elements, the residency and the, well, at that time, we were having our difficulties trying to get that through, and Coy happened to be the first, Dr. Marion Coy, right. I'm sorry. That's all right. Dr. Marion Coy was the uh, president of the American Osteopathic Association and gave our American College of General Practice a hearing, as it were, mm -hmm. in which we presented a minority report, which was a most unheard of thing. And I'm not even sure whether it is constitutionally correct at that time or since. <laughs> but in any case, the committee was going to report that we be not certified. Coy, however, was the president and could take some liberties and invited me to make a presentation as a minority report. Mm -hmm. And we did present it in such fashion. And we had persons there. Uh, quite a number from the American College of General Practice that gave a very fine presentation and therefore swayed the board of the American Osteopathic Board to grant certification and therefore we were born and that was in uh, in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. So coming uh, therefore as president of the American College of General Practitioners on a national basis Dr. Coy and I were commonly caused to be on the same junket. We had to go to Washington a few times and, mm -hmm. and a few things. And on one of those trips, it was Marge's uh, hope that we might could uh, do, some, uh, do something, no, not Marge's hope, but it was the family's hope that in memory to my wife's death and her devotion to the osteopathic uh, uh, profession, mm -hmm. that we might do something of a substantial nature here. So we suggested uh, uh, to Marion Coy, how best would we be able to do this? Would it be fine to uh, buy he, some? 
Pardon me for interrupting, but now he, in the meantime, Ooh, he, he was yes. president of TCOM. Yes, he, he then he left the American right. uh, Osteopathic Board so as you, president. So you continued to have a relationship right. with him. Right, and then he was, he was chosen here to be their first president, yes. was it? Yeah. founding president. Founding president. And uh, so we uh, continued to talk about that, and he suggested then that we maybe consider something like outfitting a room, a study room, or giving something of substance, mm -hmm. some substance to the college. And that seemed to fit into our mold to a certain extent because prior to her death, my mother and father had both died and, and uh, we had established a certain fund to the school that I think was several thousand dollars and right. we bought, oh, a little uh, viewing, uh, 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 table, glass table, glass top table, that I think is still right. on display here. Sure. And then there was a, a uh, we had constructed a, a, a cabinet. archival mm -hmm. cabinet for uh, rare books. Rare books, right. And it would lockable and right. so forth. And so that was the dedication for my mother and dad. And then when my di uh, wife died, then of course we felt that it would be wise to put some funds together and see what we could do. Well. That uh, was a grand idea, and, and the proposal was that we would outfit a room. Mm -hmm. And we thought of audiovisual things, uh, TV, slide projectors, uh, v, uh, VH, VHS uh, arrangements, right. mm -hmm. and a council table and chairs and, and the usual amenities of a meeting room. And such that ultimately this, this was provided for. But before it could be condoned, you see, it had to first pass the board of governors of the, of the coordinating board through the North Texas State University system. Mm -hmm. And they uh, came back and said, yes, that is absolutely fine, except not only may you provide all these lovely things that you have proposed, but you sure sir, shall be uh, charged for the cubic inch of room that it will occupy. And therefore, <laughs> we had to go back and we had to buy the room. In fact, Is we had right? to buy the room space. I hadn't heard that little aspect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think some 20, oh, I guess maybe now it'd be $25,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. It was, it cost to create, but it was worth it. Yeah. And it was good. And my brother, uh, who is a D.O. Mm -hmm. Where does he play? He's in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And in fact, he takes care of some of the patients that I used to take care of some 30, 30 years ago. I see. And uh, then my uh, two sisters, uh, one of whom uh, uh, has a daughter that graduated from this college. And anyway, now, we have you know, visited. I didn't know that. Who is oh, that? Yes. Uh, Your that sister was, has, uh, you know, you have a niece who graduated? Here? Yes. Well, somewhere yes. or another, our PR didn't uh, function too well. Well, our public information. Uh, Highland. Highland. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I know who you're talking about now, yes. but I didn't know the, your relationship. Yes. At the time, I believe that my brother-in-law was the Attorney General of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, he was the man under whom the original records were allowed to transpire to originate the New Jersey School of Osteopathic Medicine. So he's been quite a figurehead, right. and I think quite a phenomenal one. Well, I tell you, you got one more deal in your family. We all yes. say something yes. about. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, my wife uh, uh, and I had, uh, uh, well, she had three pregnancies, the first of whom died. I see. The second one was my older daughter, who is a, a attended TCU, mm -hmm. Another and program, graduated huh? uh, as a registered, well, a nurse, and yeah, then right. subsequently was registered, and she is now a, uh, a, uh, a school nurse at the Arlington system where she they live. In Arlington. Mm -hmm. And then my, uh, uh, our third then pregnancy, uh, I think the Lord looked down on us, said, well, you lost one, we're going to give you twins, so we'll make up for the time. So we had twins. Had twins. And uh, my son is in practice with me. He also graduated from Kirksville right. in 78 and coincidentally had the occasion to write most of the orders on his mother's death process, mm -hmm. as it were, as gruesome as that sounds, but he was then caused to be involved in the management of a dear one 
uh, during a most tender time. And the doctors that helped us from, from all aspects were so helpful and worked with him and I think gave him a reassurance of being able to participate in the management of this, this assured process. Anyway, um, my, his twin sister uh, is uh, married to, uh, went, my son first went to East Texas, as did my daughter, uh, mm -hmm. twin daughter. And uh, then subsequently she married a graduate of TCUM. No. TCU. 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 So I have three graduates in my family. Uh, uh -huh. uh, my older daughter married a, another colleague from TCU. So we have a lot of representation there. We're having so our, our homecoming tomorrow at TCU. I, uh -huh, they could well be there. Right. But the other one is married to a career officer who started here at TCU. And he is now a colonel in the Army. Mm -hmm. Just got back from his most recent command in the Mannheim area of Germany, and he is now located uh, in Washington, D.C., where he is attending the War College. These are preparatory steps to oh, maybe a generalship or something on that one. Well, that's very interesting. Let's go back now to T. Robert for a moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you have, uh, you received uh, a very what I consider a very coveted award back about 1981. Tell us a little bit about the Founders Medal that you received. I was most pleasured to, to be named a, a recipient of that award. And I feel that we stand alongside of names of persons who are really somebody. And I don't include myself in that. I feel privileged to be a part of that. I can say amen to that myself. I surely can. Yes, I should say. Yeah. But these are the movers, I think, the people that have uh, been such a creative uh, giant together. Yeah, yeah. They've just done tremendous work. Yeah. Well, you've had a tremendous career now since 1944? 45. Well, uh, you went into practice in 45. I 45, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's been... It's 45 years since I graduated from Kirksville. Right. Uh, but I'm going to wait till my 50th anniversary and then go back and visit the old folks. <laughs> oh, you're going to wait till your 50th. Oh, well, that won't Certainly. be long off. Uh, before we leave TCOM yes. and the contribution that you've made, and you have made uh, in all your humble uh, ways and uh, uh, your personality and so forth has just been a standout in my memory. Of course, I, I've identified TCOM and T. Robert Sharp almost from the, the time we opened the doors of the bowling alley. Yeah. But I remember meeting you in some meeting. Uh, we had one night there right after we, and I remember you had on a bow tie then, and you've worn a bow tie ever since. Uh, For years. Not the same one. No, but <laughs> it might have been. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, uh, uh, you, you've watched us grow, and you've helped yes. us grow. Yes, yes. Uh, and you have been a great, tremendous help. Uh, can you give me uh, just a summary of uh, what your critique about the school is? Well, I am so fortunate that we had a number of the people that we did have in places of authority. At the times that things were needed, just as the coincidence of Dr. Marion Coy in our appeal for general practice, mm -hmm. He came here to us, shining with the excitement of having just served as a national president. We've had other persons who have dotted into and out of our scene, either constantly or repeatedly, repeatedly, uh, in giving a, um, uh, an impetus to this school. And I suppose it gelled with the foresight of those visionaries that were able to conceive MedEd One. Um, out of virtually uh, <laughs> darkness, as it were, and trembling fear of the future, we grew to such mightiness. Mm -hmm. um, granted, it was with state support, and it was with the North Texas State Teachers, no, North Texas State University. My wife graduated from North Texas State University. Uh, right. North Texas. Uh, Teachers Association? Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, but anyway, uh, the right people at the right time, I think, is what has happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, of course, is evidence of it. 
uh, the people that help to garner about themselves these other exciting folks that were informed mm -hmm. and make them a coalition of, of very great positiveness. There's just nothing like it in the osteopathic profession. And all other schools bring with them a history of don't do that because we can't do that. We never have done that. And mm -hmm. here, I think maybe in the more true tradition of Texas, we'll see if it can't be done. Mm -hmm. And it usually is done. Right. And it's been that sort of thing. And that we have done so very, very many things. And I just can't believe but what this is the base. And then when we feel secure, then we will branch out into the educational possibilities in our affiliate hospitals like Corpus and Houston and, and uh, those in the Metroplex area, of course. And I'd like to see something in the north part of the state that would be a, an educational schema that would be directly tied with the, with the uh, college. In part, it is. One of the great things that has come out of some of the visionaries has been the development of a rather large, I think something like 18 uh, segment general practice residency under the tutorship or the umbrella, if you please, of the T, uh, Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's that type of growth that we have to have to be creative. We certainly, and I, I think you told me that a year or so ago, over half of the practicing DOs in this state are graduates of this college. Right. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in another <clears throat> 10 years or 20 years, certainly, those of us who aren't are going to be in the <laughs> uh, very, very small minority. Right, right. And uh, that's where it should be. It's creative. We've taken on people. It's just kind of like uh, what has happened, what happened to our United States. We took in all these diverse foes. Mm -hmm. uh, we coalesced them, put them in together, and just came out with a tremendous growth pattern, right. and I think quality growth pattern. I can't imagine that there's any other school that is not totally envious of us. We don't have to tear down something to build it up. That's right. We don't have to throw away time-honored rewards or, or ideas and then instill new ones. We don't have that two-way street. We have a positive type street. Tremendous. I hope that the other colleges in like circumstances like New York and, and New Jersey and the uh, Cali California, mm -hmm. and New Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Florida, yeah. yes, New England, and so forth. I hope they have that same imp uh, impact on their community. Right. But we certainly have it here. And I think my observation is that our observance by others, both allopathic and osteopathic, look back at us as being the front line um, organization to emulate. Mm -hmm. it just, we just do it right. We do it the Texas way. Well, you have had a great deal to do in making it possible for us to do it right, and we sure appreciate that. Uh, what would T. Robert Sharp like to be best remembered for? I would hope that the general practice image would be so polished as to stand, if it has to, stand apart, but stand as the, as the emblem of what other schools should be offering. I think we can do that. We have such a great start. We have such a great faculty of non-affiliated TCOM <laughs> faculty, right. but still so very interested all over the state. And I would hope that we could keep an image of general practice both at our college here and as that that people would love to become like mm -hmm. throughout the state. Yeah. I think that would be it. And if I can have a part of that, then I would say maybe I've helped to get that started. And that would be enough. Well, good. Well, T. Robert, Dr. T. Robert, it sure has been a joy and a privilege to visit with you and kind of reminisce and go down memory lane with you and come to the, up to the present of October the 20th, 1989, 
We're certainly delighted that you could come over from your practice today. I think you're off on the uh, I've just gotten on, smart. On Friday, so <laughs> we're glad to have you with us today. Thank you Thank very, you very much. Appreciate it.